Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so tonight we have Gerilyn Henrahan as our moderator. She is an artist, curator, professor, and director of the Atelier and Spring Gallery, who works across cultural platforms. Uh, her focus is on interactive public art, sculpture, ceramics, painting, and conceptually based work. She's worked internationally with her curatorial work, which spans historically relevant works of art and contemporary art practice, exhibited in museums, public art venues, galleries, and art fairs. She completed her Master's of Fine Arts at the School of Visual Arts in 2002. Gerilyn has previously been interviewed on three occasions for the PS1 Museum of Modern Art radio station and on National Public Radio, the BBC in New York and London, um, the Tele Burn in Switzerland, Air Canada in Toronto, and on Havana TV in Cuba. Her work has been favor favorably reviewed by Sculpture Magazine, The New York Times, Newsday. I'm gonna butcher this. New, Mubil sorry, New Bildende Kunst, Time Out Magazine, The Village Voice, NY Arts, The Brooklyn Rail, Kunst Bulletin, Art Observer, uh, at, at Boosters, sorry, I don't know if I said that correctly. <laughs> Um, you can correct me, Gerilyn, and the Resonance, well as many local newspapers and numerous international publications. Her work has received support from the NCR Media and Pro Helvetica Arts Council of Switzerland, as well as the Puffin Foundation, and support from Switzerland's Foundation Nestle and Stadtburn. Her work has been collected in public and private collections internationally. And she is currently developing an extensive series of large scale porcelain figurines, which I love, and is an active member here at A2A. Thank so you. here is Gerilyn. Thank you. And I want to thank Kristen, and also um, you've been great help. And also uh, Mario, who proposed this uh, panel to uh, Doug Scher, who asked me to moderate it. So I wanted to thank everybody uh, for doing that because I got to, you know, get to meet all these great artists. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just share my screen and, and um, you know, I'm going to start with Max because I'm just, I just did it alphabetically and I put myself at the end to, you know, uh, so um, let me just do that now. And then we're just going to, um, okay, so it says, um, I think you have to enable me to share my screen, Kristen. We can have there's a, there's a, um, a window in the middle that says this meeting is being recorded. And it's, um, I don't know how to remove that. Oh, you Nick can, got it. You can move it down, so. <clears throat> um, you should be able to share your screen now. Thank you. Okay, everybody can see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right, fantastic. Okay. So um, the thing I'm really excited about, uh, first I want to explain the uh, where I came up with Miracle Mud because I know Ellen had asked. And that was, you know, so whenever I have to do something like this, I always, I like to do research. So I do a little research. Miracle Mud was something that happened in the Bible where there was a blind man and Jesus spit into the dirt and made clay and put it on his eyes and then he could see. So I thought that was allegorically uh, kind of interesting. Now it's also Miracle Mud is a fabulous um, algae farming thing they're doing to collect fossil fuels. So if you wanna make a good investment, <laughs> that would be a very good one. Um, anyway, so I wanna start with Max, all right? And I'm just gonna read your bio because all of your bios are pretty extensive and interesting. So it's just easier for me so I don't forget anything. And then we'll go straight to your images and you can just say, you know, talk about your process. And uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by your circle. Everybody here's surfaces uh, because I don't know how you get them. I mean, the surfaces are so clean and clear in all of this work um, that it kind of um, is really, I really would love to hear uh, that process too. Um, okay, so Max Lehman was born in Fort Knox, Kentucky and grew up in uh, Phoenix, Arizona attended the College of Arizona State University in the 1980s 
majoring in intermedia media arts with a focus on video and installation. Max's knowledge of ceramics came by practical experience while attending ASU. He apprenticed at a FNR pottery studio in Cave Creek, Arizona. Later, he went on to work for the Red Horse Clay Company in 1990, and Max relocated to New Mex Mexico and currently lives in Namby, just north of Santa Fe. The primary focus of his creativity is storytelling. And I noticed there's a really strong narrative in your work, and I really want to talk about that. Uh, character creation in, uh, and imaginary worlds. His work employs a variety of ceramic construction techniques slab, extrusion, hand modeling, slip casting, and the work is very geometric and brightly colored with imagery influencing by, influenced by folk art and pre-Columbian culture. Max's teaching experience includes the Summer Ceramic Workshop at Oderbein University in Westerville, Ohio, Santa Fe Community College, and Santa Fe Clay in New Mexico. So let me just go to your images and you can take it from here, all right? All righty. So <clears throat> before I start, um, I think that it is important to uh, state that uh, Santa Fe and uh, the Rio Grande Valley, where we all, where most of us live, um, is uh, unceded Tewa territory, and uh, the descendants of those people still are very much alive in this area, and I just feel it's very important to acknowledge that. Also, where I live in Nambe, is also on the Nambe Reservation, uh, very near the Pueblo. So uh, that's, I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, this is native land and people are still here, um, making art and living and what they do. Um, <clears throat> let's see, so I've been in Santa Fe uh, in the area for about 30 years now. Uh, I moved here really to escape the heat of Arizona. I, when I turned 30, I was just, I had had enough. I couldn't handle 125 degrees in the summers anymore. So, um, you know, I like Geraldine said in my short bio, uh, most of my ceramics experience came because I was working uh, at potteries, um, you know, or production uh, studios. So I really just kind of like learned ceramics from hands on. Um, I had had an interest in it from when, from when I was young. But uh, it was only after I started being an apprentice in these studios that I really started to take it seriously and understand it. Um, a lot of my work is influenced by science fiction, uh, popular culture, uh, geometry, like it said, uh, pre-Columbian art history. Uh, I've traveled extensively throughout Mexico. Um, I've also worked in Mexico, um, although my Spanish is terrible. So uh, I think it just, uh, that just speaks to the idea that um, art really is a universal language. Um, the pieces that are up right now on the screen, the first one is called Gidget Goes to Saturn. And that piece is probably, I believe from around 1988, it was very early on. Um, I had started exhibiting with the Elaine Horwich Gallery. And at the time she was the biggest gallery in the Southwest, she had a gallery in Santa Fe, Scottsdale, Palm Springs, and Sedona. And uh, this was one of the pieces that uh, was that she took on into her gallery. It's, I believe it's about 36 inches tall, made in different parts and assembled. And then the surface of this particular one is painted. I use a variety of techniques. Uh, sometimes I use glaze, sometimes I use paint, um, sometimes I use both, it just goes back and forth. Um, after I had moved to Santa Fe, the piece with the multiple, the image with the multiple pieces in it um, were a series that I was doing that I refer to as the Toys of the Gods. And it does exhibit a, a very strong pre-Columbian influence in it. Um, most of these pieces were painted. When, uh, when I say paint, uh, what happens is I use a white earthenware that uh, happens to have been formulated by James Marshall and is available uh, commercially here. But um, the white earthenware, when it's fired, it comes out of the kiln, the first firing, very, very bright white. And the very first thing I do if I'm going to paint a piece is I paint it entirely black. From that point, I start laying down colors using uh, spray techniques where I start with very, very dark colors and I start to build up layers. 
Um, some of the pieces can have as many as 30 to 40 layers, depending on what kind of an effect I'm trying to achieve. You can't really see the depth of the surface uh, in these images, but it can be very, very rich and very, very bright. Um, I also have in the past employed neon in my work. And uh, as you can see, I've also done, um, I focus on very figurative things, but uh, I'm also very influenced by the idea of toys. And uh, especially, I think it's interesting that there's been a whole toy movement in the United States uh, these days. So that's one of my major influences. I'm wondering when I was looking at these, uh, because they, they all seem to, I, I, did you ever think about putting these into animation? Because there's actually an artist in uh, Crocetta, Italy, Neil Barib, and he does marble pieces. They, they kind of remind me of these. I'd like to introduce you to, but, you know, and I keep saying to him, when are you going to do put these, these things that want to talk? When are you going to put them into animation? So I just wonder if you ever think about that, because you have that background. Yeah. Yes, believe it or not, I've taught uh, animation at the community college uh, up here in Santa Fe. I also taught web design. Um, I do have a very, uh, you know, I have a broad background in um, technology. And currently, I'm also the webmaster at the New Mexico Tourism Department. There you go. So, go ahead. I said, there you go. You're ready to go. <laughs> yeah. So, these pieces, so the, the tower on the left, I'm assuming it's on everybody's left, uh, was called the Happily Ever Afterlife. And uh, it is the two lower sections, the purple and the black section are actually drums that are about 26 inches high, I believe. And then the temple and the goddess on top, um, you know, it, the, the entire thing stacks. Uh, and the idea behind this piece was, um, God, I don't know, how, how, how do I want to describe it? It was purchased by a physicist over in Los Alamos many years ago. Uh, and uh, he said that, you know, he just liked it because he made, it made him smile. And I think that, you know, part of what I'm really trying to do is, you know, I would just, I, you know, I just, I want people to have a better day, you know, uh, and people... Uh, come come to your work and they bring their own stories with it. So, um, you know, it's just that it just really kind of struck a chord with him. And uh, recently um, I was able to get in contact with his wife. Um, he unfortunately had passed away, but I think that she was looking for a happily ever afterlife with him in the next world. Um, the Red Skeleton is a piece that I created, I think in 2009. I'm not really sure, but there was a very, there's a very famous Mexican uh, ceramic sculptor. His name was uh, uh, Alfonso Castillo Orta, and he was from the state of Puebla. And uh, he was probably one of the most um, famous uh, Dia de los Muertos uh, sculptors. And this piece is an homage to him. I was able to meet uh, his wife, at Los Galandrinas at a festival they were having out there, which is where I had learned he had just passed away a few months before. And so I never had the opportunity to actually meet him, but his work had such a profound um, you know, impact upon me. Um, I felt that I had to create some kind of an homage to him. And uh, he has pieces in the National Museum, in Mexico City, that are just, I mean, I guess you could call them candelabras. They, they are Day of the Dead, but you know, he has huge sculptures of Frida Kahlo with monkeys on her shoulders. And there's all the skeletons and the food and everything going on around them. So, but uh, this piece uh, means a lot to me. I have it in my private collection. It's been exhibited uh, several times around the country. Uh, it's taken awards. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm very proud of it. And uh, no, when I look at it, I think about Alfonso Castillo. I'm wondering too, one of the questions I wanna ask all of you is, you know, um, if, if, there's a, if Ken Price is somebody you think about in your surfaces, because like I said before, your surfaces are so sublime and that was his obsession, you know, um, that, you know, he just would, uh, his surfaces were just incredible. And being that he, his home and studio was in Taos. I'm just wondering if that's anybody, any of you think about, so. Um, I love Ken Price. Oh, yeah. We all love Ken Price, I think. But I'm thinking, yeah. of, I'm thinking of his surfaces because they're so, 
obsessively beautiful and you all seem to have this going in your work so yes shall i continue yeah. okay so the piece on the left um that has a very interesting story it's from uh 2013 and um it is called uh what is it called if I can remember, I have my puntos para siempre, which means together forever. So again, we're kind of like dealing with the idea of an afterlife. Now, when I use skeletal imagery or a skull or a calavera or something like that in my work, what I'm really, to me, it doesn't really reference death or departure. To me, uh, you know, a skeleton or a calavera kind of evokes memory. You know, it's like because it's one of the only things that's left of us, you know, I mean, we're finding, you know, the, uh, the anthropologists can pull skeletons of humans, you know, out of the ground that are 20,000 years old, you know, and so it's kind of like, you know, this physical memory that we have. But um, that piece, uh, there was that year, the Aradora uh, Tequila uh, Company um, had come up with this idea to have like a big art contest. Um, and it was, uh, they chose 10 artists from eight cities across the United States. Um, I believe that New York, Atlanta, um, Miami, Santa Fe, Los Angeles, uh, I think Seattle. Um, most of the places that, most of the cities that have very strong art communities were chosen and they chose 10 artists from each city. And uh, after they had vetted them, of course you had to apply to get into the contest. And uh, once, you be, once you were made part of this, uh, they would, um, they gave each one of us a full-size tequila barrel. So that is an actual tequila barrel. Uh, it weighs about 200 pounds. It did come empty. And uh, I think it was about three and a half feet tall. Uh, it was really amazing. And so this piece, uh, I just kind of wanted to, the idea was I thought I had to get the barrel off of the ground. And I've always been kind of fascinated by locomotion, you know, airplanes, trains, automobiles, that kind of a thing. So um, this is kind of like this couple who are driving into the afterlife and they've just gotten married. And uh, I am proud to say that I did win the local contest in Santa Fe with this piece and went on to compete in Miami. So at Art, Art Basel that year. So that was a lot of fun. It was a big milestone in my career. Um, the piece, what on the right uh, is, what's the yes. What's the scale on that piece? The piece that on piece, the I believe, I have my notes here. Um, that piece is 60 inches high, uh, 48 inches in length and 36 inches wide. And the ceramic figures are quite large that are sitting in it. Uh, there's a platform in there that they could fit into and everything. So uh, it was like, it was a lot of fun to build that piece. Uh, it was also very challenging because it's like, oh my God, what am I going to do with this barrel when I actually got the barrel? It's like, Ugh, you know, what is this thing? You know, at that point I could have used a tequila. So <laughs> anyway, the piece on the right is called uh, City on the Edge of Forever. And uh, anybody in the audience that is a Star Trek fan will recognize that uh, um, title because it's after a Star Trek episode from the original uh, um, from the original series when, uh, of course, Spock and Kirk go back in time. But uh, I also had been reading, um, oh, God, what's his name? Um, the the uh, Discworld series, Terry, I can't remember his name. It's been a while. But, um, you know, if there was an author who's writing about, you know, a world that is flat, you know, and this is like a depiction of some of the earliest worlds that humankind existed in. And of course, it's kind of using some of the Indian imagery where the world rests on the back of four elephants who are standing on the back of a turtle. And of course, I had to have a calavera at the bottom of it. So, uh, you know, because we're all kind of like born out of death and everything. And uh, this was just a lot of fun. You know, I think that this piece is about five and a half feet tall. So it's uh, almost as tall as a person. And, uh, you know, it's showing it's, if you can see it in the round, there's a lot going on in it because the volcano is erupting and a city is collapsing. There's also an island on the other edge where the temples are falling off the edge. Uh, there's a sea monster. 
And then there's the figures that are kind of in front that are praying that their world is saved along with the ferry boat going over the side. But uh, again, this has a really beautiful surface. You know, um, I'm looking at a lot of different floral motifs, you know, in a lot of ways. Uh, I've always thought that di diversity is very important. And uh, so I like to acknowledge other cultures and other people, other ideas, you know, rather outside of the re Western realm. And that's a painted surface, correct? That is a painted surface. Mm -hmm. So the piece on the left, this is called Cthulhu's Handmaiden. And uh, it was, I created it for a show uh, that opened in Denver in 2020. And uh, again, you know, I, I do a lot of reading. And uh, when I was young, you know, of course, I think when you're a teenager, you know, H.P. Lovecraft becomes a very uh, interesting uh, author to follow and stuff. So I've always kind of wondered what Cthulhu's wife would look like. Cthulhu is this ancient amorphous being that came from outside this dimension, outside this universe. And they fell into this universe and ended up, he ended up on earth. And uh, it said, they, the, the mythos says that he sleeps in a city beneath the sea, waiting for the stars to align where he can, you know, leave the city and reawaken. And, uh, you know, it's, but there's eons and eons before that happens. And uh, so, you know, I just wanted to use, uh, you know, that, so that kind of gave me the idea for the figure. This one is probably, I think about four and a half feet tall. Um, it also stacks in sections. Uh, the lace is actually a technique where you take uh, real lace and soak it in liquid slip and then drape it onto the form. So the, uh, the skulls around her waist are, to me, they're images. Uh, these are the widows of sailors who have been lost at sea. And um, the lace on her dress is actual lace that's been fired after it's been impregnated with uh, the slip. She uh, also kind of like, to me, is kind of like a Donna Reed kind of figure. So she's uh, preparing dinner and she's holding up um, four, three cans on her, uh, on a plate, you know, cause she's going to make some kind of sandwiches, but each one of these, like in one there's tentacles coming out of it, you know, which is uh, a reference to Cthulhu. Another one is another elder God. And the one on the bottom is, uh, I think it's like packed in fresh blood, something like that. Of course, we have a classic sea monster on the top. And then there's, um, you know, the, the galleon where uh, they've unfortunately, the Kraken has risen and uh, they got caught on the top of the sea monster. So, and this surface is also a painted surface, although there are elements that are glazed in this one. And uh, there's some enamels used on her. Um, the piece on the left, I think it's called the House of the Night. This was a very, very large mask. It's about uh, three feet wide by three feet tall. Um, it was done for the same exhibit in Denver. And, uh, you know, this one, um, God, I don't, I'm not really sure where the idea came from. To me, it looks a bit like a Pomeranian, you know, because the, the fans coming out of its head. But, um, you know, again, it's just kind of like a reference to like nighttime and silence, uh, you know, just again, maybe part of the afterlife and uh, the, the floral designs and everything on it, that's all enamels that have been put onto the clay. So, uh, you know, with a, with a matte black surface. Okay. I have a question about the stacking. I mean, that was a, something Brancusi always did uh, seamlessly, but uh, when you stack them, when you when the piece is done, do you make the stack permanent, or is it that's how it, you transport it? It's so it could be shippable. Okay. I use flanges and cylinders, yeah. you know, and they all fit down inside of each other. That's really you know, and yeah. sometimes I'll make structures inside the piece that to make sure that the weight is distributed evenly as it goes down throughout the entire thing. So uh, the piece on the right uh, there. Again, if I can remember the name, was no added artificial intelligence. Um, <laughs> these two pieces are interesting um, because uh, in 2020, I became very, very ill and uh, spent uh, some time in the hospital. And when I got out of the hospital, I was very weak and did not know 
if uh, it was going to be possible for me to pick up um, my ceramic practice again, because, you know, uh, clay is heavy, you know, and you make large scale pieces and they can get very heavy very quickly. So these two pieces, the blue skeleton, which again is kind of like going back to that homage to Alfonso Castillo. Um, these, we decided to do a, a show at the gallery here in Santa Fe and decided to call it the life of death. And it had two things uh, that were going on in it. One was it was to force me to get back into my studio and start regaining the, my upper body strength so I could start working in ceramics again. But also it was kind of like I was reflecting on, you know, the, you know, on having almost died in the summer of 2020. Uh, I am fully recovered now, I'm very happy to say, but you know, there, it still makes you wonder about things. Um, it's unfortunate because the back of the green piece has a lot of art deco kind of elements to it. And um, the character on the top, um, I kind of call them thought emojis. They're kind of like auto emojis or robots. And so it's kind of like thinking for the main character who uh, is kind of like to me a little girl because she's also holding her robot, which is where there is the, where the artificial intelligence has not been added. And uh, she also happens to be wearing Dorothy's ruby slippers. Um, yeah, so the piece on the, the, sometimes I will make narrative and, and literary references in my work quite often. Uh, the blue skeleton, um, again, I love the color blue. I was like, you can get, you can begin to see the surface um, in the image, you know, how it's layered and built up and stuff. There's enamels on it where the, like in the guy's eye and everything, but on the top is like a Quetzal bird sitting, sitting on an egg and uh, on either side of it is uh, the, the, the nest is made out of fries and there's uh, hamburgers on either side of it where the flies are standing, um, you know, partaking of the, uh, of the hamburger. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, Max. We're gonna- Thank uh, you very much. Great, thank you. We're gonna move on, up, over to uh, James Marshall and um, James uh, was ed ed in the ceramic arts began with a pottery apprenticeship in Guatemala while serving in the Peace Corps. Uh, for two years, he lived and worked with the Quiche, a Mayan, a Mayan First Nation tribe during his service, assisting in a pottery cooperative in agriculture. In 1977, he began his studies for an MFA at the Rockham uh, Graduate School, uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. John, uh, John Stevenson and Rudolf Arm Arm Armheim, author of Art and Visual Perception, were his mentors in the research, development, and production of his work in sculpture. He graduated with an MFA in 1979. Uh, his sculptures and drawings in clay, wood, bronze, copper, wire, steel, graphite, and charcoal are included in over 200 pub public and private collections and museums, uh, nationally and internationally. His work has been widely published in books, magazines, newspaper articles. For the past 20 years, James has been program head of ceramics in the School of Art and Design and Media Arts at Santa Fe Community College in New Mexico. As a teacher, he is committed to expanding the experience of making of art to everyone. James lives and works in Santa Fe where he maintains two studios. So hello, James. I'm very curious about this first uh, image. So I'm gonna let you take it from here. Right. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? I'm sure I think I have my, my mic on. Yeah. Um, I have a, a rather complex life as a sculptor. I've worked in so many different mediums. Uh, I began my art life really when I was about five years old, building uh, abstract sculptural boat shapes in, in the basement of the house where I lived. Uh, but um, I came into ceramics in college and apprenticed in the Peace Corps with a pottery and um, moved away from ceramics uh, after about five or six years when I got into grad school. And um, it was there that um, I started working in um, sculptures that were more uh, installation type sculpture. Um, is this, part I'm fast. A, is this part of a performance? I don't mean to interrupt, but 
Yeah, the performance piece. Uh, this is the performance piece. This this piece actually uh, continues on to the present day. I I did this piece in grad school. Uh, it's it's basically it's a uh, it's an image about life on Mars, and I present myself as this uh, scientist person and uh, talk about the unusual properties of Mars and gravitational pull and light and, and things. And then to, to prove that there was life on Mars, I transmogrify my image into a Martian with Martian dirt. That's, it's a total spoof, but it was, um, it was a performance piece that evolved from my having been asked to give a lecture about art to an art appreciation class. And I thought to myself, well, you know, you can't talk about art. You know, what, what, there's nothing to say. So I think I'll do art. And um, it, was, it, was, it was fantastic. The, the students were young. They were sitting in the audience. They were writing down, taking notes because they thought that I was an actual scientist. And at the end, I had this head, in, head, this gargoyle head on my shoulders. And I'm wandering out in the hallway. And I stopped the professor and I said, excuse me, but could you direct me to the men's room? And he's, he looked at me and he said, you must be from the biology department. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so, so that's the story of that piece. And that continues on today. I still do that uh, performance. Um, after, after that, um, I decided to do a 180 degrees and, and back off image, story, um, fantasy, and, and basically remove everything from what I'd like to build. And I started with a square. Um, the square on the left was one of the first pieces. This was done in 2002, about 20 years ago. And um, I had to resolve a lot of technical issues uh, working with clay at, at, at this scale and with these surfaces. And so uh, Max had mentioned that I had, I along with uh, a guy in Albuquerque, his name is uh, Brant Pally. He owns New Mexico clay. We, de we designed a clay body. I said to him, Brant, I want a clay body that doesn't warp, shrink or crack. <laughs> and he said, good luck, James. <laughs> good luck with that. But we came up with this formula called, it's WES, which is a white earthenware sculpture clay body. And um, then I had to figure out a way to fire the pieces. The, that piece is um, probably a, a 30 inches square. And I had a real hard time firing these pieces in a, in a scut kiln. And they were all splitting, cracking up the middle uh, due to the, 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 the quickness of the firing process. So. Um, I created what is called a ramp firing method, which uh, brings the, the piece up to temperature very slowly and was able to save the forms. So from the square, um, I started morphing off of that. And the piece on the right, the, ye the yellow piece, um, when I built, I started bu building pieces like this and I was searching around for in my journals about like, what now what is it that I'm, what is it that I'm doing here? What, what, what's this work about? And I found a statement, a little line in one of my journals that I had written 12, 12 years earlier. And the line was said, when does an ordinary object move into other dimensions? And so we can flip to the next, next, two, page, next, next two pieces. And so um, I realized that that's what I was doing. I was taking ordinary forms, ordinary objects, and I was morphing them into something, almost something else, but not quite. Mm -hmm. uh, Max and I work diametrically opposed. And yet I think in, in some strange, bizarre way, we're, we're speaking about the same thing. And that's the, the mystery of form, the mystery of image, and how an image can be so many different things to so many different uh, people viewing the object. And so um, that's when the form started to shift. And that's really when um, I decided to really investigate surfaces. And to think about um, someone's right. Yes, I'm going to talk about my finishes here. 
um, the, 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 the glazes are lead. Uh, they're a uh, bisilicate lead, they're commercially produced. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to create uh, depth and some kind of a deeper mystery in the surfaces. So I bought all these lead glazes and I ran probably two or 300 glaze tests um, and found about eight or nine surfaces that I loved. Um, so what I do is, or for, these, for this series, what I did was I would paint on a green or well, the piece on the left, fire it and then bring it out and then work with lighter colors of lead colors that relate to greens, um, sea foam and sage and different things. And I would brush on thick layers. The pieces go through four or five different glaze firings and I use the kiln to paint the piece. Uh, I layer on the glazes and fire them and I'll bring out the piece and if it still needs more work, I layer on more color and keep firing until it's done. And so I use the temperature of the kiln to move the glaze, which is how I got the surfaces, uh, so rich and deep surfaces. Uh, the one on the right is harder to read, but it also has layers of lighter and darker red colors. And, you know, this is when I, I started to sort of embrace or acknowledge the power of color and how the, the power of a color can change the energy in a room. And it became that this, like the saturated chroma was sort of like, it became sort of like a color mantra for me that how it can really, uh, you take a simple form and then you put this incredible color on the surface and it, it just transforms the energy around it. Um, next slides. Uh, the orange on the left is a, the same process but I found that um, lead glazes became obsolete. Uh, a lot of the, the glaze companies couldn't produce them because of the federal laws regarding lead. And so I did, did a little research into where, yeah, I was gonna mix my own lead, lead, lead bisilicate glazes. And um, after talking with uh, a technician at uh, Ferro Frit Corp, he said, well, you're going to have to wear a hazmat suit. You're going to have to have an air source and you're going to have to, you have to hose down the room after you're done mixing these things. And I did some research to find out where the lead comes from. And it comes from one mine in the U S and a couple of mines in central and South America. And I realized people who work in these mines basically are dying, especially the ones in Latin America. And so I decided to uh, not work with lead anymore. Uh, so the piece on the right, the, the black piece is uh, an investigation into the color black or really they're not black, they're like, uh, like um, a graphite, dark graphite gray and two tone. Next slides. Uh, the, the image on the left is an installation called uh, black interfusion and each piece uh, the concept there is uh, one, each piece has a, a fusion of two different forms coming together. <laughs> that's pretty good. Thank you. I, that's, that's a great background. I love that. <laughs> um, Excellent. Will people who are watching mute yourselves, please? If you're just watching, thank you. Okay, so we were talking about this one and then, or both of them, the monochromatic series. Mm -hmm. Right, the monochrom. So, so the black, the black series. This, this was an exhibit in 2017, entitled um, "Black and Confusion." A really successful show, beautiful show in. The Jerry Peters Gallery in, in Santa Fe. And uh, the image on the right was the last um, exhibit I did this, the beginning of uh, this year um, called uh, Emergence. And this was during, these pieces were built during the COVID, uh, the, the wave of COVID coming through the world. And I wanted to create images and color that would bring light into people's lives. So these are, these are forms that came out of that whole that series. 
Yeah, they almost and look like alabaster. I'm sorry? They almost look like alabaster. Yeah. They um, it's these, the, the surfaces were inspired by some rocks that I found in New Zealand that were sedimentary rocks found in the, in the rivers. And they had layers of cream and gray um, and lime on them. And so I used that as uh, inspiration to change the surface. And the thing about surface, you had mentioned, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is anyone influenced by, you know, Kenneth Price? Well, I think, you know, I want to address that. I think that ceramic artists are challenged with surface because not only do you build the form, you fire the form and it comes out of the kiln, but then you have this whole other realm, this whole other universe of color and and texture on a surface with 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 glaze and with on gobes. And so I think I'd like to assume or or guess or maybe make a statement that we are Kenneth Price and or Matt, probably all ceramic artists are inspired by to make surfaces that that the ceramic chemistry and the ceramic medium can 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 make we're all kind of barking up that same tree and we all come out with radically different surfaces i mean max's surfaces are certainly the opposite end of the universe from mine uh, and yet um it's probably the final frontier for ceramic artists to, to figure out how to do surfaces that really really relate to the forms and take the work into a whole nother realm. So. I was wondering uh, if you, if you uh, was in, were inspired by Peter Volkos's work. The, the um, I, I was, I saw Peter Volkos uh, on, in a super mud conference in the mid seventies. And I, um, uh, I was, in, I was, in, he and Toshiko Takezu and uh, Don Wrights and Robert Turner were all on stage for making their work. And the thing that inspired me about all of their work was not their work, but their relationship to how they were making their work. I mean, they were so engaged and so intense, uh, each in their own particular way. I realized way back then in my 20s, okay, that's what it takes. That's really what it takes, a total engagement. Uh, with, with the kind of work you make. So that's that. Uh, there's one last image on the left of uh, emergent, emergence. Again, uh, the liminal or the, the unknown form, it could be this, it could be that. We don't know what it is. If I can instill or imbue into the viewer uh, in, their, in their thinking mind, what is that? I don't know, it could be this, it could be that. They, they walk away and you've got them. And how you get them is that you, 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 they carry with them the creative impulse, the creative impulse. And I think that good art should do that, can do that and will do that. It can inspire the viewer to go beyond after they've looked at the work in the gallery, go out into the world, they see the world in a different way. I mean, is that not what we do as artists? That's part of our job, right? To transform the way people see the world. Very, uh, very Duchampian, right? Uh, but the thing also is, um, when you, I think it's always interesting when people talk about what they were doing when they were little, because you were talking about making these boats. And when I first started looking at your work, it has a maritime feel. The forms still have that, you know, some things, because I live on the water, so. If you want to watch TV, let me know. I mean, I, you know, absolutely it's Sort right. of interesting. Yeah, I, it wasn't pre-planned. It just sort of keeps coming out. So uh, started a long time ago. <laughs> I love that. Thank you very much. Yep, um, thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to Mario Quiles. I believe, hopefully uh, he grew up in the Bronx and it's the High School of Industrial Arts in New York City before going to receive his degree at Cooper Union School of Art. Post-graduation, uh, he worked as an art director in New York for in the advertising world, residing in Soho Law for over 20 years. 1985, he moved to Los Angeles to continue his education at Glendale Community College, where he went on to study ceramic art, glaze chemistry, taki, and low firing techniques. 
Making his way to Portugal in 1990, he paid a visit to an old friend in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and has been living there ever since. He currently resides in Las Vegas, where he continues his ceramic practice. Uh, his work has been shown in various exhibitions and galleries in Philadelphia, Chapel Hill, uh, Los Angeles, Kansas City, San Angelo, Texas, San Diego, Santa Fe. His upcoming show will open on September 2022 at the Aurelia Gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and is part of the permanent collection of the National Hispanic Cultural Center. So welcome, Mario. Hi, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I ended up starting uh, playing with clay when I was about six years old because my dad gave me a very expensive tank, a mechanical tank made by the Marx Toy Company. And I took it apart and never put it back together. And so the next thing I ever got was clay because it couldn't destroy it. I took it apart. <laughs> And that's how I got into clay. And as a uh, elementary school student, I got into a show at the, uh, I think it's uh, Palmer, or uh, actually probably Colgate House on Park Avenue. And I was very uh, rewarding to get recognized as an elementary school student. Anyway, after that, I went into working for uh, the Buick division of General Motors, uh, doing uh, designs of small nomenclatures over the uh, glove box, the steering wheel, the hubcaps, and played around with that for about three months and decided that Detroit and uh, where I was, were not very favorable for a kid from the Bronx. So I went back to New York and got into graphic design. I've been the uh, art director of Eastern Airlines, the New York Daily News. I've done work for the Village Voice and uh, a variety of other great companies, Ingersoll Rand, uh, and uh, Dun & Bradstreet. I used to do all of their publications. I ended up going back to school after I left New York and took up um, ceramic chemistry classes at the uh, Glendale Community College. The, uh, at that time, you can recognize that it was so inexpensive, it was $28 a credit unit. And <laughs> so I got in there for about four years doing incredible stuff with raccoon firing, building kilns, uh, learning techniques and upping the temperature, recognizing the variety of colors that change within a kiln that you can observe by the naked eye. And that got me into several galleries in the LA area. And uh, I then decided that uh, Los Angeles was a place that if you didn't have any basic roots, you were a stranger. And no one talks to you when they're going 85 miles an hour in another direction. So I had a friend here, Elias Rivera in Santa Fe, who's a well-known painter. And I was on my way back to Portugal where I'd lived for almost a year and uh, had re returned several times, uh, I, I think it's one of the greatest places to live. And so I got back to New York and ended up working for my former employer, uh, Lippincott and Margulies, which was at the time one of the largest design companies in, in the uh, country and Europe. Anyway, got out of that and uh, started thinking about what to do, came to Los Angeles and uh, started going to Glendale Community College and doing a lot of ceramics. What you're seeing now was um, an accident. I used to go as a kid to City Island to fish. And uh, 
always intrigued by the ocean. And so I ended up thinking about what existed in time before we uh, came out of the ocean. And uh, so these are, my pieces are all imaginative interpretations of what may have existed once I got here in the Southwest, you know, all of this vegetation we see once existed underwater. And so what else existed underwater? You know, shapes like the one on the right uh, were the beginnings of cacti and other forms of uh, succulents that operated very well in water. And one of the conclusions was that there's not enough water here so all of that which lived in and under the world of water has dried up and become uh, cacti uh, and a variety of other greens that are now not looking so green. Uh, and so this is how I started forming things. I also like texture because I think everything had texture. In fact, they've recently discovered that Dinosaurs had enormous um, skin textures that are very, very unusual and no longer exist. So I used to go to Canal Street in New York and buy rubber mats that had different surfaces on them. And then I'd cast them in plaster and roll clay on them. And so my work is extremely thin because I roll everything on a, a, a plaster board that has texture designs in them. All of these surfaces, the one on the right uh, has uh, a texture of pox and they come in and out or out and in. Uh, and so that's exactly how I ended up getting involved uh, in the um, colorfulness of things. I give James Marshall, credit for introducing me to a variety of color intense um, elements at the community college in Santa Fe. And I spray all of my work. So it's uh, part uh, uh, variations and gradations of a specific color by weaning it down either with water or with uh, white. And uh, learning about angobes was the secret to being able to low fire and get intense colors. If you come up to the next one, you'll see that the color variation with spraying can give you an intense beginning and a very finite uh, ending. And all of the pieces that I do are all sprayed. Um, I've just now hooked up my basement for doing firings. I have a kiln, I have a spray booth, and so I'll be continuing to, continuing to be doing these gradations of intense colors that kind of fade away. Uh, I, I did an awful lot of classes in pastels at New Jersey Institute of Technology, teaching architectural students how to do background renderings of their designs. And uh, I did that for four years uh, in a program called City Without Walls. And so they were, the students would come to New York and at my studio uh, every Saturday and uh, have a, a good intense experience and then go down to Chinatown to have lunch. So we had a, a, an incredible come over, have some coffee and then have a great uh, lunch at uh, a restaurant in Chinatown. Uh, the uh, upshot of the story is that I've met many of my students who've become New Jersey officials, one of them in charge of the reservoir water systems as an architect. Anyway, the pieces on the left, the last one, are called topos, which for me were the tops that kids would spin with a uh, 
a handle on the top and make them the faster you went, the higher the pitch. So those were all done with an on-glaze on uh, intent. And, uh, right. and what's the scale on those? I mean, how big are they? These are all, uh, these are all uh, at least 14 inches in diameter and then as high as 10 inches. Uh, and, and some are even bigger. The ones, the red one in the back is even bigger. I think it was 18 inches by 12. Beautiful, really beautiful. Thank you very much. All right. Great. Uh, Cheryl, um, we're gonna introduce uh, Cheryl Zachariah. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. <laughs> uh, she was born and raised in New York area and lived in Manhattan most of her adult life. Uh, she went to Southampton College and she majored in painting, but spent many years pursuing a career as a singer songwriter. And she performed in New York club circuit for over 10 years and is a published songwriter. Miss, uh, she missed her visual roots and she began working in clay, which started her on a new path. She studied and taught in various potteries and has exhibited locally and nationally. Her pieces have been published in magazines and books and are in various museums and private collections. Most recently, she won an award for a piece in the San Angelo Museum of Fine Arts in the Ceramic Biennial. And she completed an eight month extended residency at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City. Uh, she admittedly uh, considers herself a diehard New Yorker, but she recently moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico to live out her dream of being a full-time artist for the home studio. And she looks forward to a different place where her energy can go into her work and she can enjoy the surrounding beauty and culture that that area has to offer. So quite a, quite a, quite a switch, right? So yes, quite a switch. I'd be curious to see if that uh, influenced the work. I mean, it must have, right? I think so. A lot of people say that my, they see music in my work and, um, I started writing songs when I was only nine years old, uh, kind of like most kids would write in a diary, except that I wrote songs. And, um, but I also started in, in high school, I had this wonderful art teacher who is, you know, encouraged me a lot. And so I ended up going to school and be, as a painting major, but I dropped out after about a year and a half. Cause I just felt like I, I was a, I was a singer and a songwriter and I wanted to go to New York and, and do that. So um, after not getting a record deal at age 35, I thought I was a, you know, over the hill when I was 35, at, if we can all think how funny that is. But anyway, um, I took a clay class at the suggestion of a friend. Um, so I never intended to be a clay artist. I just kind of fell into it. And just to go back to the first if you could go back, I'll start talking about uh, this first piece is called Sunset Groove. It won an award recently um, at the Wayne Art Center in a national show. And the woman who juried, uh, I can't think of her name right now. I'm so sorry about that. But she uh, was the creator of the PBS series Craft in America. So that was a, a pretty big deal to me. <clears throat> and it's very much inspired by the skies here. Um, I'm in awe of the sky here, um, the colors, the sunsets. I'm doing a lot of pink work now. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm having an allergy moment here. Uh, and you can see it's a two-part piece. Um, I started doing stacked pieces a couple of years ago because I wanted to be able to go larger. So that top piece comes off and like Max was talking about his work, there's flanges inside so and I don't connect them um, and so that they're easier to ship and and so forth. The piece to the right is a, an older piece that's called Triangular Conversation and I want to talk a little bit about because we are talking about our surfaces and people think my work is very surface oriented but it's also really more about the form um, when I make a piece, I want the form to be, to stand alone. And then when I start to draw and paint glazes on it, it's really 
a way to enhance that form. So if you look at my pieces, you can really see how the lines follow the shapes of the form. Um, I also, in these, I think we're missing some pictures, but the piece on the right I can talk about is called Urban Poetry. And um, I'm very into grids. I'm a great lover of modern art. I was very inspired by, you know, Paul Clay, Picasso, Diebenkorn, I could go on and on. I think I look at painters more than I look at sculpture. Um, but so that's very much about, and this is also one of those stacked pieces. Um, and I think, I don't know why I don't see a, an image to the left to talk about. Yeah, I don't know where that one went. So I can, I can go back, um, but I think we should just go forward. I'm not sure where that went, but. Okay. Oh, you, you, I mean, your surfaces still feel very much about painting. I was thinking Paul. Well, yeah. they're, very, they're very layered. You know, we just, when I was teaching at Greenwich House Pottery, we discovered uh, by accident this terra sigillata, which is a clay slip that if it was, if one of the students put too many layers on and it came out crackled. So it's funny, a lot of people think my work is raccoon, but it's not because the dry surfaces, I love the, the, um, I'm very interested also in the matte and the shiny and the combination of the two um, adds another element to my work. And I use, a, so I use these crackled sidges and I color them. And so some of the surfaces of my pieces go on in the, while the piece is still raw. And then I fire it biscuit and I get sort of an, in, an initial palette to start working on. Then I start drawing with an underglaze pencil and as I said, I'm very much moved by the form of the piece is what, what happens, you know, um, anyway, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a little flustered. Uh, the piece on the left is called Echo Moon. Uh, it started doing a lot of pieces with cutouts. Uh, I really love negative space. And so that's a good example of, of, um, of that. And again, it's the layered surfaces, the, the terra sigillata, the oxides, underglazes, glazes. I use a lot of different things. They're all commercial. A lot of people ask me, why don't you make your own glazes? And I say, because I use about 50 different colors and I would be spending all my time making glazes. So that's why I use a lot of different commercial products, except for the terra sigillata, which um, is I have somebody make it for me and then I add colors to it. The piece on the right is called um, ba a balancing act. Um, and because I think my work is a lot about balance and line, harmony, the harmony of color. I think it's, I do think music influences my work a lot. I listen to music all day long when I'm working in the studio. It's a part of me. And so a lot of my pieces I think are about rhythm, the sort of patterns that I use, the colors that I use are harmonic. Um, and that's, you know, just was my real love was, you know, music. I mean, I love doing this too, of course. I've been doing ceramics for 30 years, over 30 years now. Um, we can go to the next one. They have a very architectural feel also. But yes, yeah. it's funny. Two friends of mine just visited who are architects and they kept going on and on about how architectural my work is and how I should have been an architect. But, you know, I was a, um, I got almost 800 on my math boards when I was in high school. They told me to go into math. And I think, you know, all that, the math and the music is related. And I think it all, um, you know, it all sort of comes together in the work. These are some more examples of actually the one on the left is four different pieces. If you look at it, it's uh, it all stacks together. It's called resting triangle. And it was one of the first of these stacked pieces that I did. And the way that I build them is I actually build them as one piece and then I cut them. And that's how I'm able to get the sections to fit so well is that they were, it was made as one piece. It's, it's kind of um, difficult in the matter of timing because you really have to 
they, you have to keep the piece drying slowly at the same rate so that when you cut the sections, um, they're firm yet still soft enough to cut and without losing their form. So you can reassemble them and it, it still looks cohesive. Um, the piece on the right is called Let's Sail Away. And that is, you know, just a new blue palette that I um, got into using for a while, uh, about a year or so ago. And I really like this piece. That section in the middle is also a negative space. And so I really like working in this stacked format um, as a way to create really interesting uh, objects and forms that are, you know, unique and and have a lot of those negative spaces. We can move to the next. Um, so um, I so the piece on the right is called Pear Shaped Woman, and I. This is, goes back um, maybe 10 years. I did a series of figurative abstract works. And so I thought I would include this just as, um, you know, I'm always trying to evolve and I'm always trying to do um, different things for myself, mostly just to get bored. I just can't do the same thing over and over. Um, I love uh, figurative work and I'm, I've always, you know, been, um, Aside from modern art, I'm very interested in primitive art and um, ancient art and the, the use of the figure. And so this was one of my favorites from that series. And the piece on the left is a really fun piece. Um, I also did about years ago, I had this dear friend named Luis Mendez, and he was in one of the first graduating classes at Alfred. And he was a fantastic artist and he was known for making heads, um, these very, very large heads that were inspired by, um, they were very primitive and from, of, other, of other cultures and so forth. They were beautiful. So after he passed away and he did a lot of devils. So the first head I did was a devil actually. Um, I decided to make a head in homage to Lewis. And then once I started doing it, it was just so much fun that I probably made, I don't know, 20 or 25 of them. And then this last year during, or two during COVID, my gallery owner asked me, did you ever do it, you know, a series that, you know, was fun and, you know, that uh, sold well and that you, whatever. So I decided to bring back my heads. And this one, which is called Blues Singer, actually has a song written on it. It's called, um, I've got the 2020 Stay at Home Blues. So the back of the piece has a whole song lyric written on it. It's a blues song about basically COVID and staying home. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. But uh, anyway, I really like this one, which is why I chose it uh, to show off the heads because very much my head series is autobiographical. And this one definitely is because, you know, it's got the guitar, although I, I mostly play piano, but I started out more performing with guitar and the microphone, I'm a singer and the notes, the notes are really actually the melody of the song. And uh, anyway, so I thought it'd be fun to show you guys that series, something from that series. So you can go to the next oh. layer. Um, so then I included this piece. This is called Moonstruck in Santa Fe. And I've done a lot of wall pieces. I don't make them so much anymore because the gallery that represents me here, she won't hang them because of the adobe walls in the gallery. Um, but this one here is eight sections. And uh, when I was in a different gallery in Santa Fe, I did show it. Uh, that was basically, by the way, the reason I never got to talk about why I moved to Santa Fe was I started showing my work out here at uh, Jane Sauer Gallery, which was kind of my dream gallery to get into. And so she started selling a lot of my work and I kept coming here for shows and it was so beautiful. And I thought I could, I could live here without having to teach and just do my work and have a studio at home and it's so beautiful. And so that's what inspired me to move here. 
Um, and so this wall piece, Moonstruck in Santa Fe, which um, sold to someone in California, it's uh, just a good example of, well, you can see that it's very much like an abstract painting. Um, and each one of those sections hangs separately, but then they're, they're hung together. And so I did many pieces like this that are kind of quilt-like because I also have a real passion for textiles. Um, so I, I, these were another big series that I did, uh, these wall pieces. And can you tell us the full scale of that? Because it's quite large, if I remember. Yeah, I think each one, each section is like 15 inches. So that would make it 60 across by 45 down. Yeah, it's a huge piece. Right. Uh, yeah, I loved making these pieces, but, it, you know, they're actually very hard to make as uh, all my, um, you know, friends here that just spoke, no, it's very hard to do flat things without them warping and cracking. And I would have to do a lot of like flipping them over and drawing them extremely sl slowly. So they were kind of uh, very um, labor intensive to make for that reason. And, you know, if one, if you lose one or one cracks, you know, it, it's a real hardship and you have to make it over and, well, one of my uh, favorite, uh, ceramic well, pieces is Legere, which reminds me of your blue head. And he, they were used. They were like 36 inches each, and it was a woman's head. But what I loved is when you went around the back, they were just labeled with a big one, two, three. Like the back was beautiful too, because it was wow. Just, it was like, yeah. Uh, but this is this is a really large piece. I. I number the piece, I number, I put numbers on the backs of each panel too. So, and they are constructed, they're not flat. They're constructed like a canvas. Oh. So they're about two inches deep. They're hollow in the back. And then they have a wire, you know, I made holes so I could string a wire through them. And so that each one could just be hang, hung on a hook. So they're really not heavy or difficult to hang, um, but they were quite complex to make in terms of, like I said, you know, keeping them flat and, you know, not having cracks and so forth. So, um, but I really enjoyed making these and I, you know, I'm a painter at heart, even though I do say that my work is really just as much about form as it is about surface. I love to paint. I love color. I love design. I love lines. And um, so that is very much what my, and I think my surfaces, you know, the, I use a lot of texture like Mario was talking about. Um, and I have the crackle terracage, a lot of surfaces and I use an underglaze pencil, which is a pencil that you can fire uh, and the lines stay there. So there's a lot of, I use oxides that I rub into the pieces and rub off. So there's a lot of layers of color. Also, James was talking about that which make for the interesting surface, I think. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what's it unique about your work is the fine art quality in it, the drawing and the painting, and it's, you, you know, it's, it's, it's uh... Well, you know, a lot of, when I was teaching, um, so I could very much relate to what, uh, you, know, uh, you know, others were talking about. I think the hardest thing for ceramic artists is you know, I, all my students would be dumbfounded. They'd love making things. And then they'd be like, well, what do I do now? Um, and for me, it was almost like the opposite. Like I couldn't wait to get to that part. And um, cause I think I'm a painter at heart. And I think, you know, others here uh, on the panel are also. Uh, so I love the, I love both parts of it, making the form. Sometimes I think maybe I should just glaze this one color and see, you know, see what it's like, but I just can't help myself <laughs> and I can't help myself. I start painting away. So there you go. All right. Beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm not going to introduce myself, um, but um, I am, I am just going to show 10 pieces as you did. And um, I, you know, ceramics was always, I was always believed that all roads should lead to Rome. So I do a lot of big public sculpture. I do, you know, I paint, I do, but now I'm kind of going into a zone with ceramics that I can kind of feel. 
Um, the one on the left is one that I made many years ago when I was having my daughter. The doctor, I had just shipped 10 tons of marble from Italy. And my doctor said, you have to stop carving marble. So I started making these little uh, maquettes in, in clay. And, and the concept was uh, that how do you go out into the world and screen out the bad? So these, are the, this, these were screens, you know, it was a conceptual fantasy. And then I ended up doing the piece uh, life size uh, for a museum, it just went out to a collection in Washington state. But that was like kind of when I first started and they, they were very small. Um, this series was, is I was at the Swiss Institute in Rome for many years, uh, living there. And um, what I did is I would go out every day and Rome is so incredible. And I would just look at objects. I would do a geodo around the Bernini, with Apollo and Daphne, and then go to the Etruscan Museum, which is right on Villa Borghese. And I would just make one of these a day. And I kind of picked this crude terracotta on purpose. And it was just impressions because, you know, Rome is a killer for, for that, right? And I put them on scaffold. This was a show at Secundo Piano at the Swiss Academy. And uh, I put them on a roll, a scaffold on wheels because I told myself I was never gonna let myself work this way again, where I would just uh, do things without thinking. You know, so the, the, that's the, that was the installation. Um, this was another one from that series. It was called Reap. And um, all of these are really inspired by Villa Giulio, which is the Etruscan Museum. I really lived in that museum because it was right across the park from where we lived. And um, so this one uh, has a hand, but if you take the lid off, it's got a, a hand that's digging. So it's so my, actually it was purchased by a, um, music producer in Los Angeles. And she said she kept it on her desk to show people when they, they signed a contract that what you sow is what you reap. So, so it also had a nice function about it. Um, this was a piece, a dynamo, and uh, it was done in porcelain. And then I made a, a silicon mold. And uh, this is a cast piece and it's on a stainless, stainless steel base. Um, and then I started this porcelain series. And when I was little, I thinking, because we're all mentioning that, I used to love to collect those little glass animals. I was infatuated with these glass animals. And so when I start the porcelain pieces, I don't, um, I don't have any idea in my head. I just start. And then these characters kind of develop. And now I realize that these, father, these, these characters are my parents. I mean, when I was making them, I didn't think about it. But years ago, it was like, oh, that's, that's Jerry and Glow, right? But I get a frustration with, I don't know much about glazes, so I'm a little bit afraid of them. But I also know that I want what I want and I don't want any surprises. So I do all my finishing work uh, from my large public works, the really, you know, the, the 50 footers or the small porcelains, I do them in the auto body shop. I, I go and I do the booth, so I don't do it. I give it to a man named Ozzy and he primes them and then I pearlize everything and I do a UV coat and the pearl seems to be a reoccurring unconscious theme in my work uh, even if you go back to something really early like this. So it's funny because I'm from the town of Oyster Bay. So maybe that has something to do with it. Um, this <laughs> is um, a little dancer. And also these are all porcelain and I put them on granite bases just because I feel uh, these are not particularly big. They're maybe 18 inches. So they feel a little delicate. Um, and then this one over here is drummer bunny. Um, and drummer bunny comes from, I love doing the clothes. I like, you know, I like doing the boots and the, that's why I was admiring Max's, uh, those bows on those shoes. <laughs> so, um, anyway, but, um, so this is a rabbit. My, my aunt was a very talented artist, but she was a very successful accountant for JC Penny. And she used to sit me down and teach me how to draw. And she ta taught me how to draw this rabbit. So this rabbit is very special to me. So these are all porcelain and uh, just went to a collection in New York. Uh, this is Nightbird. And uh, again, just starting a shape and it kind of telling me where it wants to go. 
Um, so this is also porcelain and um, pearlized in the auto body shop. So my background in sculpture is um, stone carving. I actually went to Pietra Santa and, and got a studio and carved marble for many, many years. So right now my work has always been monochromatic, almost like it's marble. But I am kind of starting to paint the pieces uh, because again, I don't know how to get the glazes I want. That's why I was so curious about everybody's surfaces. I don't know how you do it. You know, so I'm, think, I'm starting to hand paint them. This is Magi, and um, this is a, not one of the larger of the figurines. It's about uh, 29 inches, I believe. Um, and again, I've been I've traveled through India, not that that has that much to do with it, but some of the imagery comes from that. And, um, you know, the hipster clothes. I just did a series on hipsters, and those are hand painted, but I wanted to stay within my quota that I gave to you, so I didn't put those in. But Anyway, there's, um, this is also pearlized and um, UV coat. For some reason, I, I'm into the UV coat. You, it's like a crystal clear. So it just feels more protected to me. So those are the ones I shared for this. And what I was interested in this panel was just how different all the work was. And um, so I'm just wondering if Christian, if you wanna open it up to questions or are there any questions in the chat box? I see actually quite a few here. Um, yeah. <coughs> okay. Do you want to take that and just um, read the question? Yeah. As for um, questions, I mean, the first ones that Doug asked, I think Max kind of answered about the scale of some of his pieces. But Babs made um, a comment that I agreed with, with um, James's work, how it kind of the shapes reminder of Martin Puryear, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. his sculptures, which, my drawing yeah, teacher. <laughs> yeah, what was that? My drawing teacher, I was very lucky. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, all of these were beautiful. We just have a lot of nice comments here. And I'm also just really impressed with the use of color throughout all these works. They're Great, and how Cheryl said, you know, seeing herself as a painter in addition to all of her other practices. I think we, we definitely see this painterly hand throughout all of these. And then, you know, Gerilyn, with your, especially with Magi, um, there, there seems to be like this, you know, it reminds me of Jim Henson, kind of like Crystal Palace, like, amorphous like yeah they're going more and more into this direction <laughs> but no it's really interesting to hear um that they were based off your your parents is that a series of them or just you noticed you noticed that as you were making them I made them and really maybe a year or two later they I was like oh that's that's mom and dad you know I mean it was like because then then I started to see it but when I'm working I'm not really you know thinking that you know so yeah that was just yeah, because then then there was some similarity on the faces and things like that. You know, Geraldine, it, that's it's. I'm happy. To, I'm glad that you said something like that because um, you know I'll make a piece and you know uh, I, I don't know how I'm reacting to an emotion or something that's going on in my mind at the time or you know because I am so narrative and I'm looking at literary sources. But I've had a similar experience where I'll see a piece that I made 20 years ago and all of a sudden I'll be like. Oh, that's what that was about. Right, 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 right. Well, I love that you brought that up too with this being, you know, like these like figurative sculptures. I was reading just about the, not not necessarily gargoyles because they don't function like gargoyles, but the, the stone sculptures, like especially around New York City in particular, um, apparently like the, the stone workers would often base those off of you know friends and relatives and family members and right up the, up the same gods, right? the same uh, yeah different yeah. people which is interesting yeah um yeah i don't know if i can just throw out a general question i don't know if anyone has one please feel free to chime in i i don't see like any part 
particular questions in the chat. Um, so this, this yeah, what, what maybe is like the miracle moment you guys experience in your process? I know you guys touched on that a little bit, but maybe that might be a nice note to end on, like where you feel like the magic really happens for you because it's such a you know transformational. Well, I think Playing is deceiving, you know, uh, you know, often even when I first started really getting into it, you think it's nice and this nice friendly, it's a tough, it's a tough material. It's not, you know, I mean, you really have to know it and understand it and respect it, you know, if you push it too far, you know, so it's actually a lot more difficult than, than like things you have to think about the stacking and the transport and the, I always found that people you know, like I'll put just as much work into a, you know, 14 foot sculpture as I do a small ceramic. And I've talked to dealers like this. It's like, where, why is there this price discrepancy? And, you know, many years ago during mid century, the people who were selecting, uh, collecting, as they explained it to me, the people who were collecting ceramic and glass were, um, had an invested interest in keeping it into its own category. And now those collectors are passing away and their children are getting it and it's starting to merge. It's starting mm -hmm. to go into the art world. I thought that was kind of interesting, you know, but because uh, you do see a lot more ceramics now mm -hmm. in the art world, which is great, you know. It's but there's another thing that we haven't spoken about and that is that the shapes and the beginnings don't necessarily uh, connect with the outcome. In other words, as you start with this piece, hold on a second and come back just one. Oh, that piece is in the museum right now. And it's called Mansana Peligrosa, which is translated into dangerous apple. And uh, I did that to experiment with the envelopes, but the piece itself talked to me when I did the base. I then made a second piece and a third piece. And uh, it spoke as to what it wanted to be. I only interpreted it um, because of the uh, planning of the thorns. You know, thorns were created by uh, uh, items that came up from the sea to protect themselves from birds eating them. And so I always had that idea of, well, self-protection uh, is a very, very important. And it's also in what people wear masks for during a pandemic. You don't want to breathe somebody else's illness. And nature has created thorns, bark, and a variety of items to protect the surface of the vulnerable parts. Uh, in living in Portugal, I used to see these oak trees that were naked halfway up. And I asked them, well, what happened to that tree? I said, oh, well, we take the bark off to make cork and it regrows and we have to protect it by painting what remains white so insects don't come in and get into the soft part of the oak tree. And I thought, well, that's a fascinating thing to discover. But form does tell you what it wants to be in my work anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, it's very true. Like when you ask, like when I start working, I kind of put the little balls on and I, you know, and then all of a sudden after a while I go, oh, then I have to, to answer your magic moment thing. It's not, it's no. Yeah. You, you, you intuitively do it and then it, it tells you what it wants to be. Yeah, yeah. I, I was in, impressed with Paul McCartney's answer to someone who asked him, well, where the hell do you get these lyrics on these, this music? And he looked at the guy and he said, uh, it's in the air. And what you need to do is develop the talent to grab it and bring it down and turn it into music. And I thought that was fabulous because that's what it is. There's all kinds of things simultaneous, simultaneously occurring throughout the world. And 
you know, Ravi Shankar starts teaching people how to play uh, an instrument and all of a sudden it becomes a fad. <laughs> you go like, well, that's nice. Peter G does the same thing. Uh, not that I particularly like his stuff because some of it is pure pablum, but the fact is that he started playing an instrument that had an incredibly interesting sound. You know, and that all of those things to me are happenstance uh, and it's talking to you. Well, you know, I, in my work, I was going to say that, you know, I differ in that way to some of you in that I do a lot of drawing and I draw these very simple sketches of shapes. And that's where all my sculptures come from. So I really know exactly, I have a feeling probably James does as well. Yeah. Um, I know exactly what I'm going to make, but one of the two magic moments for me is when I'm done building the piece, and there are sometimes some alterations from the, you know, the drawing, of course, but very much I do stick to the drawings. Um, but when a piece is three-dimensional as opposed to two-dimensional, it's like a whole nother animal. And it's really magical to me when, you know, I'm staring at this big three-dimensional form that comes from this tiny little sketch. And then my second magical moment um, is really is the surface treatment because that is the more spontaneous part of my uh, process. I really don't draw out what I'm gonna do on the piece. I just kind of let it flow. You know, I start by drawing with a pencil on the piece and following the form of the piece and then these shapes start to happen. And I kind of figure out the color palette before I start drawing on it. I mean, the shape somehow informs what colors I think, I can't even explain it, but I look at something and I kind of, it just comes to me what, what color palette it should be. So, um, and then of course the final magic is when you pull it out of the kiln because there always are some surprises, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with glaze. That's, um, that's very, very important to understand. It's very hard to conclude, but I, it's I, very hard to understand. I had a friend who's a jeweler and uh, she did a lot of silver, silver work. And uh, I had her come and do some clay work and she says, okay, now I'm finished. Well, what color should I do? I said, what color do you wanna do? <laughs> The fact is, that's the most difficult part for some people to figure out how to paint it, how to glaze it with what. And uh, I think that that's another discovery point that comes along while you're working. Uh, I know that I have people ask, well, what are you gonna do uh, on that surface? I, say, I don't know, it's good. It's gonna tell me what to do. As soon as I put down the first color, it's gonna say, oh, you now have to do this to counteract the color that you already used. Uh, and that's, uh, it's always a discovery in that sense. Are these, are these your glazes here? This blue and yellow, it's a glaze? Yes, wow. that blue and yellow. And it starts out with a, a turquoise that I mix in a little green. And then I take and mix a little more green with yellow, and then I go all the way up to the end, and I do another yellow, or I'll do a pink blush. Because, you know, if, if you look at nature's color palette, a, a, an apple stir, turns first green, then it goes through a phase of slight yellow, dimply colors, and then all of a sudden from the bottom up, it goes red and starts coming up over over the top and if you let it stay on the vine long enough, it goes pure red. But sometimes there's a, a blush of yellow on the top. And uh, so I think that nature does give you the gradation of what it feels it wants to paint. And uh, I think that that's a, a good guide to coloring uh, uh, stuff. Uh, you know, at the Cooper Union, we learned uh, how to 
uh, from, uh, I went to night school and we went uh, uh, to uh, uh, enormous, uh, Joseph Albus, a uh, student of his, uh, was our teacher. And it was wonderful to hear uh, how intriguing colors, matching colors next to each other, vibrations that occur, and all of these theories, and then putting them into action, which was really the best part of those classes. And uh, you develop a color wheel and you develop a, a form of expressing, you know, color, uh, uh, when someone blushes, they go pink, <laughs> maybe a little red, and uh, they right drink up. too much, their nose goes red, and so forth. So <laughs> nature wants to express color all the time. Uh, we just are lucky enough to be able to see it. Thank uh, you. Thank you yeah. so much. I'm sorry to cut you short there. I no. know we we'll probably extend this panel much longer. Um, okay. We are supposed to wrap up around 8.30. So um, yeah, I'm just going to wrap us up here. I just want to thank Gerilyn and all of our panelists today. Thank you so much. Your work is really incredible. And yeah, we've all really enjoyed it. If I can leave Gerilyn with any final comments. Uh, there are a couple of you asked if this would be available, and it will be. It'll be up on YouTube. And also, uh, it might go to the Smithsonian Archive. So as soon as we have those links, we'll send them to you. And uh, you'll have to post them. So maybe other people who weren't be able to be here tonight would be able to see the talk anyway. But it's been great. And if I come out to Santa Fe, I'd like to stop in and visit all of you. Please. We're waiting for you. If I want to lose my money, I'll go to Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Okay. It was great. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.